Kia ora team, welcome to video 2 of the 2.4 series. This video is about cell transport and diffusion. So in this video you're learning about diffusion as passive transport and why high surface area to volume ratio is important. By the end of this lesson you should be able to describe the composition of a cell membrane and how it acts as a semi-permeable membrane barrier. Discuss how diffusion is in the context of different cellular processes and describe the importance of a high surface area to volume ratio in terms of cell processes. So why is it important to transport molecules across the cell membrane? Well transportation means movement from one place to another. This includes everything from flying around the world to moving molecules such as oxygen into and out of your cells. Every day we depend on movement of molecules within our bodies to digest food, remove toxic wastes, and create the energy we need to move, grow, and survive. Molecules like oxygen and the glucose need to be transported across the cell membrane before they can enter a plant or animal cell and be used. There are two ways they can do this. One, passive transport where energy isn't required, and two, active transport where energy is required. Remember from a previous lesson that the cell membrane, sometimes referred to as the plasma membrane, encloses both plant and animal cells. It protects the cytoplasm and contents of the cell, acting as a boundary between cell and its external environment. Also remember that the cell membrane is semi-permeable, therefore it can only let certain molecules pass through. So how does it let certain molecules pass through? Well, the phospholipid bi lipid bilayer is studded by proteins that go th right through the bilayer and they create a pathway for the transport of uh, materials into and out of the cell. These proteins are called transmembrane proteins. There are two basic forms of transmembrane proteins, channels and carriers. Protein channels are open to both ends, the extracellular space and the intracellular space, and allow molecules to pass through freely. For example, this is how molecules such as glucose enter the cell through a protein channel called GLUT1. On the other hand, carrier proteins are only open to one side of the cell membrane at a time, and they change shape to transport molecules through the cell membrane. Some carrier proteins need energy to transport molecules, and the most famous carrier protein is known as a sodium-potassium pump. But sometimes these proteins aren't even needed at all, as you'll see very soon. Sometimes molecules can just pass straight through the cell membrane. One of these types of cell transport is called diffusion. It doesn't need a transmembrane protein to transport molecules across the cell membrane. So what is diffusion? Diffusion is the random movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So they're moving down a concentration gradient until they're equally distributed. If you watch this GIF right here, you saw that they, the molecules all started on this end and they slowly diffused to the end where they're in low concentration until they're evenly distributed. Diffusion is a form of passive transport, so it doesn't require energy in the form of ATP. The difference in concentration gradient between the area of high concentration and the area of low concentration is called the concentration gradient. The concentration gradient only exists until the molecules are evenly distributed on both sides of the cell membrane. Once the molecules are evenly distributed, the cell membrane will become less steep over time. Steepness is often used as a metaphor for this concentration gradient. As you can see here, over time, the slide becomes less steep. Diffusion doesn't require energy because it's driven by this concentration gradient. Now let's go through some examples of diffusion in the context of different cell processes. So how does diffusion play a role in aerobic respiration? Aerobic respiration is the process of producing energy or ATP in plants and animals for growth, movement and for their survival. It happens in organelles called mitochondria, and we covered this in video one. And it uses glucose and oxygen to release this energy. You'll learn more about aerobic respiration in video six of the 2.4 series. So oxygen diffuses from the bloodstream and through the cell membranes of muscle cells, where it's used in the mitochondria of muscle cells to carry out aerobic respiration. This is because the concentration of energy is much higher in the bloodstream and much lower in the cells as it's constantly being used up inside the muscle cells to produce energy. And how does diffusion play a role in photosynthesis? 
Well, photosynthesis produces glucose from water and carbon dioxide. Glucose can be broken down during respiration into energy that the plant can use to reproduce and survive. Carbon dioxide diffuses from the air and into the leaf through pores called stomata, which you learned about in the 2.6 um, ecology series. This is because the concentration of carbon dioxide is much higher in the air outside the leaf and it's much lower inside the leaf and in the plant cell because this is where it's constantly being used up within the leaves during photosynthesis. Once it's inside the, the leaf, carbon dioxide diffuses through the plant cell membrane and into the chloroplasts where photosynthesis actually happens. Now some molecules such as glucose and sodium ions can't freely diffuse into and out of a cell. Glucose is too big and sodium ions are too charged to move through a phospholipid bilayer. They need help from carrier proteins and protein channels embedded in the phospholipid membrane like what I talked about earlier in this lesson. This process is called facilitated diffusion which is the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration down a concentration gradient using channel or carrier proteins embedded in the cell membrane. Its only difference from diffusion is that these molecules are actually unable to diffuse through a cell membrane without the help of specific carrier proteins or protein channels. So facilitated diffusion is still a type of passive transport because it doesn't require energy in the form of ATP. The process is driven by that concentration gradient we were talking about. Now there are many different factors that can affect the rate of diffusion, both simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Molecules will diffuse quicker at higher temperatures than lower temperatures because e increasing the temperature causes molecules to move faster. Also, if the concentration gradient is steep to begin with, the rate of diffusion will be faster. And gas molecules diffuse much faster than liquid molecules. However, the most important factor that affects the rate of diffusion in cells is the surface area to volume ratio of a cell. This is often abbreviated to SA colon V. So let's talk about this more. When a cell grows, the contents inside the cell, its volume, increases at a much greater rate than the cell membrane, its surface area. This is because when the surface area increases, it increases by a square factor. So like centimeters squared. And when, but when volume increases, it increases by a cube factor, so like centimeters cubed. So we say that as the cell grows larger, the surface area to volume ratio decreases. And if cells get too big, there's comparatively less membrane per volume available for these essential molecules like oxygen to diffuse through. And if a cell gets too big, there's more cell contents, the volume, there's more of this that require these molecules in order to function. So diffusion is less efficient for larger cells because essential molecules like oxygen can't reach the center of the cell fast enough. The cell that's too large will also be overloaded with toxic waste products like carbon dioxide in animal cells because waste molecules are not able to diffuse out of the cell quickly enough. And if a cell gets too large, it may divide into two separate cells because that will increase the surface area to volume ratio. It will increase it and diffusion will become more efficient. Cells are dependent on this efficient diffusion process because they need diffusion for respiration and photosynthesis and for DNA replication. They need this to occur at an optimal rate. Because the surface area to volume ratio is so important in the efficiency of diffusion, cells are dependent on an optimal surface area to volume ratio to function properly. So therefore when a cell gets too large, the cell will divide to keep a high surface area to volume ratio. This concept is especially relevant to questions about the cell cycle and DNA replication and mitosis. So please link this slide to videos 5, 6, 8 and 9. The cubes in this diagram represent a cell. The larger 2 cm cube represents a large cell, which has a much lower surface area to volume ratio than this small cube, which represents a small cell. Now we will be doing an experiment very similar to this phenolphthalein experiment in this video here. 
The experiment demonstrates how diffusion becomes less efficient as the cell surface area to volume ratio decreases. This experiment and our experiment uses different sized agar cubes that are infused with a pH indicator called phenothaline that you may have used before in year 10 science and year 11 science. These cubes are then placed into an acidic solution. And by observing these cubes over time, we will see that cells that have a decreased surface area to volume ratio, like the big cubes, will have inefficient rates of diffusion. And different cells have developed different adaptations to increase their surface area to volume ratio. Some cells, such as the root hair cells, increase their surface area by having an elongated shape. This increases the amount of membrane available for diffusion while reducing the amount of volume of the cell. Other cells, like the red blood cell, have a biconcave shape. This is a disc-like shape with a flattened center, almost like a donut. For red blood cells, this increases the surface area available for oxygen to diffuse in and out of the cell. Other cells and organelles have many folds in their cell membranes to increase surface area. For example, cells that line our intestines are responsible for absorbing the nutrients from the food we eat, and so they need to maximize this rate of absorption. To do this, they require a large surface area, and they're covered with many folds called microvilli, which are long finger-like projection, projections on the top of the cells. This creates a very large surface area, allowing for a maximum diffusion rate. So Kapai, you've reached the end of this lesson. So by now you should be able to describe the composition of the cell membrane and how it acts as a semi-permeable barrier, discuss diffusion in the context of different cellular processes, and discuss the importance of a high surface area to volume ratio in terms of cell processes. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.